me I need you to survive I pray for you you pray for me I love you I need you to survive I would harm you with words from my mouth I love you I need you to survive it is his will that every needs be supplied you are important to me I need you to survive I pray for you and you pray for me I love I need you to survive. I would harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important. Yeah, 
Kai saya bo Bawani kamal ka So So the second song was a song in Hausa language and it's it means Lord Jesus there's no like unto thee in the whole earth there's no like unto thee Amen Ready to go Yes sir I actually told Brandon we should sing a choir special today too. Just you know, I was trying, but he didn't. Uh, he didn't go for it. But definitely appreciate that song. Um, I, I I love the way it just kind of build builds up and then all the harmonies come in. So um, that was that was great. But I think it was been maybe a month ago. I'm not sure the exact date, but I did say that I, I did a sermon on the night service. And it was about olives and olive trees and the different significance that it has with the church and different comparisons you can make. And I alluded to a couple things that you can make comparisons as well, because God, being a great teacher, can use the same thing and you can learn multiple things from it. So you can learn a lot about Jesus and about salvation and different things like that from a lot of those same examples. So I hinted to a part two, and, and that's what today is going to be. So, part two. So, if you would, if everyone would turn to Exodus 27. We're going to go to a couple different verses here. If uh, you guys would mark this spot, because we will come back here a little bit later. But uh, this is just kind of where I want to start. And then uh, we're just going to read one verse, and if everybody will just kind of think about that as we go, and then hopefully we'll make some connections as we go through this. So we're going to start here in verse 20. So if you have a little heading in your Bible, if you have a study Bible, it'll say, oil for the lamp. So that should give you an idea of where we're going. So, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. And uh, we'll just, we'll go ahead and go to verse 21. In the tabernacle of the congregation, Without the, without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statue forever until their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, just want to wanna thank you for today. Thank you for everyone that's here and just the ability to uh, bring forth your word. Um, I just ask that I not get in your way, that I bring forth the word that you want, that people be attentive and uh, gain something from this, Lord. And I hope every time we open up our Bibles, we're gaining something, Lord. And just uh, want to thank you for the wonderful special that we just heard. And just ask that uh, you be with everyone here and that you be with the message, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, like I said, just hold your place there. And uh, I want to go and kind of revisit just a few key points because I know not everyone was here that that Sunday night so it was all about how the church can be compared to olives and the olive tree and why God would use that as, as, as an example and God being a great teacher will use something that we here can understand and that we can relate to to expound on some spiritual truth so a couple of the points that we uh, looked at were that olive trees thrive in bad soil even if it's not being cared for. And that's, that's very true. And that's, as Christians, sometimes we find ourselves relying on God in the hard times. We don't necessarily rely on him in the good times, which is not a good thing, but God thrives in that, that, that bad soil, right? That's the only way to get saved is you have to admit that you're a sinner. So we looked at that. We looked at uh, how the Gentiles are grafted in, and if you want to write these references down, you can read in Romans 13 and Ephesians 2, and that is all about the church and, and God's primary focus moving not necessarily away from the Jews, but towards the Gentiles, and how the Gentiles are grafted into God's family, and how scientifically you can take wild olive trees, and you can take their branches and actually graft them into a good olive tree and produce fruit that way. So just even from a science perspective, a worldly perspective, you can take something here on earth that we have, and then you can learn some spiritual truth. And uh, it just goes to show you that God knows what he's talking about when he wrote, wrote this book. Um, we also looked at the harvesting of olives and how 
the way that they did it was they took a stick and that they would hit the tree one time. They were not supposed to hit it more than once. They were supposed to hit the tree one time. All the olives that were ready to pick would fall and they would gather them up. And then also that they would be soaked in a brine and you'd have to remove the pit and that's how you get the olive oil and the olives that we eat today. So we compared that to the Christian um, that sometimes you have to be chastened, that you have to be baptized, soaked in that brine, and then you have to remove that root of bitterness out the pit of the olive. So just some, some spiritual things that we did look at. Um, things that you can learn from the olive, the olive tree, and that's just some, some key points. If you want to know more, then I know it's online. You can go back and, and, and look at that. Um, I do suggest that everybody look up what I'm saying. Don't just believe it just because I'm saying it. Look it up. Look it up in the Bible. Um, and even as far as the hitting it one time, I actually did find the verse. So I am going to go back on that. So we'll look at that. If you would, we'll turn to Deuteronomy 24. So I didn't write down the verse last time, and I was like, oh, no. So I found it. Be 2420. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bots again. It shall be for the strangers, for the fatherless, and for the widow. So they were supposed to harvest this, this whole chapter is different things, that they're supposed to harvest different things one time. And they're supposed to leave the rest for, for different people. But that has a very good uh, spiritual application, and I hope everybody paid attention to the beatists that once. Um, there is a picture of Christ um, involving Moses, where they needed water from this rock, which is water from a rock. How, how are you going to get water from a rock? They're, they're in, in the wilderness, and Moses is told to strike the rock one time. So he does, and water flows out. They come to that rock later, and he's told to speak to the rock. And it was supposed to be this great image of Christ and this, this great picture, and Moses ruins that, and he strikes the rock a second time. And uh, that's ultimately why he didn't make it into the promised land. So there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things that point to Christ, even in the small details. And you don't want to mess, miss those, you don't want to mess them up. So like I said, I just touched on this a little bit. I do want to focus on the different uses of olive oil. Um, I wrote down back here, it was used for different things like medicine. It was used for light. Uh, it was used to eat, obviously, to make the olive oil, and that olive oil could be used, you know, to cleanse different wounds, different things like that. Olive trees, they live over 2,000 years and still produce fruit. You can make a comparison to that to the church age. Hopefully, we're still producing fruit. We're producing other Christians after 2,000 years. So um, those are different things that you can look at, but I do want to focus on some salvation aspects of what we want to look at when, when doing this. I got a little overwhelmed throughout the last week because there was actually too many references and too many ways I wanted to go and I thought it was going to be very easy. It's never the case. And uh, just amazing all the different things the Lord can show you, but this is kind of what I settled on. And um, we're going to look at a couple verses here. If you would, turn to John. So we're going to spend a little time in John. Somehow I always end up in John. So we're going to read the first five verses of the book, John 1. Give everybody a second to get there. All right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life and the life was the light of men, and that light shineth in, a dark, in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. So we're going to look at comparing Jesus to light in a few different places. He himself compares himself as well. So I want to start there, and then if you would, we're going to go to John 8. Like I said, I'd like the Bible to do the talking. I don't want to do all the talking. So, John 8, 12. 
Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So once again, Jesus comparing himself to light. We're going to go one chapter over in John 9, 5. And Jesus says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So I picked out three verses there that were fairly close together so we wouldn't have to turn all over the place. But Jesus is comparing himself to light. And what do we have to learn from that about olives, right? So um, he is the light of the world. You don't, if you have him, you don't walk in darkness. Obviously, you don't want to walk around with no light. You could trip, you could fall. Well, in that same verse that we read earlier, our opening verse, Exodus 27, 20, if everybody would turn back there. I told you guys to save your place, and I didn't. So... So in this verse, a very small verse, easy to kind of look over, but it says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. So I know Mr. Rockwell did a study on the tabernacle not too long ago, and he also did it in Sunday school one time with us, and just about everything in there can be compared to Christ in some way, shape, or form. So anytime you see them talking about the tabernacle, we want to be like, okay, yep, and then just keep, keep flipping, and you want to skip over it, but there's a lot to learn there, uh, just like the genealogies we all like to skip, right? But there's a lot to learn about that tabernacle, and when you actually start looking at it from what God is trying to compare and the different things he's trying to give you right there, um, it's some amazing things. So you have this light that's supposed to burn continually. Now... Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He should be burning continually. Right here, though, when it says, bring the pure olive oil beaten for the light, it was not supposed to be crushed. It was supposed to be very specific how they got it. It was supposed to be beaten, and it was pure olive oil. So what that would be for us today would be like extra virgin olive oil. It's the first oil that comes out of the olive. They actually had a process that they would put the olive through to get different kinds of oil out that were used for different things. The best, the purest, would be the best tasting, the brightest light that would, be, that would burn from this olive oil came from the very first olive oil that came out. That would be the pure olive oil. So they were supposed to give the best to God. But in turn, that light is also burns brighter than if they used another olive oil. So you have a picture there that God, Jesus Christ, is supposed to burn the brightest. You're not supposed to dull that. You don't want to water that down, and you don't want to mix it with anything. So I kind of put in here just a side note when I was, I was just writing, and I was like, I wonder how many churches are using maybe the third or the fourth oil that comes from the olive. Maybe there's a bit of a dimmer light in there. So a watered-down Jesus, and that's not how it's supposed to be. So, but it also meant sacrifice for the Israelites because that would have taken the most money. Right? They could have sold that for the most. They could have profited the most from that olive oil, which was their source of income. But they were supposed to take what cost them the most, and they were supposed to give it back to God. But in turn, God gives more than we could ever give, right? He gives that light. Now, it was used very specifically for the candle that lit the tabernacle. That's what they would have done, what we would consider their Bible studies, or their preaching, or their ministry and the sacrifices, so on and so forth. What if they try to do that in the dark? What would happen? You wouldn't get anything done. You wouldn't learn anything. And that went back to what I wrote down here about the churches. You know, how, how much light do they have and how effective is it? So you have some truth, but it's a watered-down Jesus. And, um, you know, just recently I had done this, and um, I've worked on older cars, not newer cars. And so the headlight on my car went out, but I didn't know because my, my older car, the headlights were very dim, so you had terrible light to begin with. And so now my car has these bright lights, so I'm driving, not realizing that one side is not really lit. And um, when I'm going to work, I go through a road that there's actually deers, and there was actually a deer crossing the road, and I couldn't see it until I got right up on it. 
and I had to swerve and miss it. If I'd had both headlights, if I would have had that bright light that I'm supposed to have, I could have avoided danger before it got that close. So it's kind of maybe a silly example, but it was something that I was like, wow, you know, sometimes the Lord will give you these little things, and uh, you know, I understand, I understand I was studying for this, but sometimes I wish the Lord wouldn't uh, cut it so close sometimes, trying to give me examples. But, but just you know, something simple, you change that light and you have that bright light again. But you should have that bright light shining, and it should be Jesus Christ. Amen. So, um, I also want to look at this, that it was used, oil was used for a cleansing purpose. It was used to help cleanse wounds. It was used as an antiseptic, things like that. So, I want to look over here in Luke, if you'll go with me to Luke 10. So we're going to switch over to the New Testament here. We're going to start here in verse 30, and we're going to read all the way down to 34 just to get what's going on. So this is a parable that Jesus is talking with the Good Samaritan. And it says, And Jesus answered, answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him from his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest the, that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he, had, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So the point of taking everybody here to this verse is not necessarily to go into the story, but just so that you don't take my word for it, that oil was used for cleansing and things like that. So you can actually see it in the Bible. Um, you also had a mention of wine there, which is also another picture of, of Christ in a different way with his blood and, and, and different things like that. But you have right here oil, which this would have been olive oil used in an antiseptic way to cleanse wounds. So... Um, I'm also going to have everybody go back to Matthew 9. Hopefully everybody's keeping up. So we're going to read one verse here, just verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So the first verse we looked at was about olive oil and wine being used to, to heal wounds. And right here, you have a direct, we can make this comparison. Jesus was going around and he was healing people, healing, healing people that were sick. Um, but also... If you would, we're going to spend a little bit of time back in John, John 9. And I want to bring everything together so that you understand why we're going to the verses that we go to. So we're going to read the first 11 verses. So John 9, 1. And Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made, made manifest in him. And I just want to stop right there. I want to explain it. It's not that they never sinned. It's speaking particularly about why he's blind. It's not that neither one of them never sinned. It's just that the sin of his parents or himself did not cause this blindness. So picking back up in verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it, is, while it is day, that night cometh, when no man can work. So, thinking about Jesus being light, he's working while the day is here. So, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So, once again, Jesus directly comparing himself to light. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, 
and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which I may be pronouncing wrong, which is by my interpretation sent. Uh, I'm sorry. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before, before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said that it is he, others said it is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? And, answer, and he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go into the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I, and I received sight. So a couple things there I brought you to this little account right here because Jesus is directly comparing himself to light. Once again, that brings our verses together. But also, I find it very interesting that Jesus gives him a, a way to be healed. Jesus could have healed his eyes right there. Just healed him, and he could have been on his way. But he gave him something to do, and that man believed it, and it was his faith of believing in Christ that gave him his sight. So... He comes back and people see him and they recognize him, but they see a difference, they see a change. And then exactly what they said, and they said, therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? So hopefully all of us here have someone that have come to us and they can see a change and can say, how were your eyes opened? But then even when he gives credit, he doesn't say, oh, I, I washed my eyes and it, everything was fine. They said, um, he told him what he told him to do right here in the last verse, verse 11. It said, and he, when he washed, he said, I went and washed and I received sight. Okay. So he's saying it was given to him. It's not anything that he did. It was given to him. So you have a picture of salvation right here and something that Jesus did for a man giving him sight that we can learn from now. So hopefully we can all say that now. But if not, Jesus Christ, he's the one that died for our sins and you can receive sight. So, he um, said he's comparing himself to light. He's healing people, olive oil, used for healing properties. It's used for the light in the tabernacle. Um, but I want to look at a few things here because I'm going to compare it to blood. And so, when I was talking about this, a couple people said, Jonathan, when you're comparing blood in the Bible, you have to use wine. I was like, but God uses different things that you can learn different different ways that you can, you can learn different things. So um, the olive oil that is pressed out can also symbolize the blood of Christ, right? If you think about it, we're supposed to be the lights of the world, right? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and then we're supposed to reflect that light. That light in that tabernacle was used, and it'd be basically the blood of Christ. It's something that we are saved by the blood of Christ, and that's how we have that light. So there is a comparison there, but don't just believe me. We're going to go through it. So if you would go to 1 Peter. First Peter 2. So... Um, a little bit of background, of course, Jesus died on the cross. He suffered a, a tremendous amount of agony and a lot of pain, suffering, so that we don't have to. So we're going to look at a few verses on that. And it's First Peter 2, we're going to look at 21 through 24. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged, judged righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his, body, his own body on the tree, that we, being dead in sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed." So Jesus took all that, that punishment and the suffering, and he took the sin for us. Somebody who, ne who didn't sin, never sinned, no guile found in his mouth, didn't deserve any of it. He took that sin for us, and it says, by his stripes, 
you're healed. So it's the healing blood of Christ. And I just also want to talk about the, the watered-down Jesus that you don't want to have in, in your temple. You don't want the watered-down Jesus being in your Bible either, taking the blood out. So um, don't water down what Jesus did. It's extremely imperative and important to understand. And um, I want to go to Ephesians now. Keep in mind when they refer to the cross in that last verse, they refer to it as a tree. So we're going to look here at Ephesians 1 7. In whom you have redemption, speaking of Christ, through his blood, for forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So, once again, redemption through his blood. All right, now we're going to go to 1 John. All right, we're going to start here in verse 5, and we're going to go through 7. This, then, is the message which we have heard, heard of him and declared unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That goes right along with the verses where there's no guile, no hatred. He took our sin for him. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of, of Christ Je Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So, right here, you still have light, the obvious, the opposite of darkness, and Jesus Christ cleansing us from our sins, just further proving that his blood is an important piece in this. So if you would, go back to John 14. So we're doing a lot of, a lot of jumping around, and I appreciate everybody, everybody keeping up. So this should be a verse that everybody knows, but it's John 14, 6. Jesus saying unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus lays it out, not being harsh, he's just being truthful. He says, you're not going to work to heaven, you're not going to get there unless you believe in me. And it's all the things we read before. It's belief in him, it's his blood that he shed, it's the work on the cross. Nothing that you do. And he lays that out very simply here, and that right there makes a lot of people mad because they want to work to heaven, but you can't do it. So, um, like I said, a lot of people say, we're, we're going all this stuff about blood, but how does that tie in with olives? So, I want to look at a few things. This is when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. So, we're going to look at two different accounts of the same instance. So, Luke 22. So we're going to start here in 63. Um, so actually, we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane a little later. I apologize. I got ahead of my notes. I skipped around a little bit. So just talking about by his wounds, his stripes, his work on the cross, his work on the cross started before he got to the cross. It was leading up to it. So I want to go over some of the things that happened to him, and I apologize for skipping ahead a little bit earlier. But Luke 22, we're going to start in 63, and we're going to read 64 as well. This is him being beaten, and some of the things that happened to him before he even got to the cross. So 22, 63. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many... Oh, that's all. I'll start there. So they smote him. They hit him on the face. They struck him. They're beating him. And they're mocking him. So we're going to look at another verse here in Mark. So if you'll turn back a little bit. Mark 14. And we're going to look here in verse 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face, 
and to buffet him, and to say unto him, Prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So you're looking at the same thing going on there, and they're hitting him, they're beating him. It is very interesting, though, when Jesus spat on the ground and put it on somebody, it healed him. They're spitting on him and mocking at him. So big difference from the world and the Lord. So, um, but I, I brought you here to see that they, they were hitting him, they were beating him, just being ruthless, tormenting him. Um, and that, that work, all that was the work that was leading up to the cross. But that's where it started. The, the bloodshed, everything started from this point. Um, now, how this ties in with a few different things, this doesn't have to do with olives, but I mentioned the tabernacle. So if you would, go back to Exodus. We're going to read three different verses here in Exodus, just talking about the beaten works in the tabernacle. And how, when you look at this tabernacle, you should really look at it from the eyes of looking at how these can reflect Christ. So 2518. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat. So just to show you, they're making these cherubims of gold, they have to make it as a beaten work. Um, probably for time's sake, I'm just going to go to Exodus 37. And we're going to look here in verse 17. So we talked about the candles that would burn and the light that would burn. Well, here you have uh, the candlestick. And he made the candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work. Made he the candlesticks, his shaft and his branch, his boughs, his knops, and his flowers were all, of the, all the same. So now you have the candlestick ma stick made from this beaten work. So um, there's something to that. They had, they had the ability to mold. They had the ability to cast Different, different things. They came from Egypt. Aaron made the, uh, the molten calf. So he had to be able to create something that he could melt down and create a mold that they could have used and would have been much easier to use. But God specifically said that these things that signify Jesus and it being gold with no impurities of a beaten work because that all signifies what happened on the cross and it was supposed to be a picture leading up to that just like Moses in the rock. But unfortunately, Moses messed that picture up. But we can look back and we can see that. So I just want you to see that. But in our verse that we opened with that I hope everybody still held their place to, Exodus 27, 20, you don't have to turn there, but it says the olives are supposed to be beaten. It's of a beaten work. So once again, comparing Jesus to, the, to those beaten olives. So this is where I wanted to go, and I skipped ahead a little earlier. Now we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you would, Matthew 26. And this is something that I did not know until actually studying this out. And um, I know that many people that have been up here have said this before. You learn a lot more when you're studying it out than you actually give out. Um, and it, you end up with more than you know what to do with half the time. But Matthew 26, and we're going to read two accounts of this because they both have something that's very key in them that I want everybody to look at. So we're going to start here in verse 36. So, Then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray, yonder. So we're going to read all the way to verse 41. And he took with him Peter and, and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. So he's wanting them to pray with him. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from, from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he came unto his disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, 
what could ye not watch for watch with me for one hour watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation the spirit ind- indeed is willing but the flesh is weak so jesus knows what's coming he knows the work that god wants him to do that beaten work and all that he's going to have to take on and jesus is asking if there's any other way but nevertheless not my will but thine and so if you would we're going to look at the same account but in luke 22 What I want you to take away from that one is that it names the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're going to look here in verse 39. And he came out and went as he, as he was, was what? To the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he, when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeling down and pray, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So Jesus is praying so hard and so earnestly, and he knows what's about to come, that he's sweating blood. And I've heard a couple people uh, preach on that alone, about sweating blood, that it is possible. You have these bodybuilders and these heavy lifters, that when they're lifting their heaviest weights, they find that they will actually sweat blood. So Jesus is lifting the weight of the world at this point, and knowing what's going to come, and he starts to sweat blood. And the key thing is here, you, right here it's mentioned as the Mount of Olives, and it's mentioned over there in Matthew, that Garden of Gethsemane. I want to take note of the name of Gethsemane in Matthew, and the fact that he sweat blood in Luke. Because when we started, we talked about the different ways that they received the, the olive oil, right? This was before everything happened, before that work started, that beaten work, and when you look at the Hebrew name for Gethsemane, or the Garden of Gethsemane, it's oil, or uh, olive press. So, Jesus was in the olive press at this point. So what I have written down here is the light of the world went to the garden to pray. So the light of the world went to the olive press. So you have the connections there to that lamp. He knew it was about to come. What was to come was the beaten works, that beaten olive oil that would light the world. And ultimately, his blood would cleanse us and heal us from our sins, and he was hung on a tree, which you can go back and look, and God's using an olive tree as that example. So you have salvation laid out all from olives and olive trees back from that light that was used to light the tabernacle. So, I wrote down this last little, little thing here for everybody. Um, hopefully everyone here can say that they have the light of Christ. And uh, if you don't, hopefully you can look at this small little bit that I went through about how he was beaten and the anguish and agony. And if you're not saved, hopefully you can realize that he did this for you because he is the only way. Um, so if you're not saved, hopefully you can make that decision today. If you are, I want to leave you with this. The different, the different types of olive oil and what they were used for. I mentioned the first. It was the most expensive. It was the pure olive oil. And that went to the church or to back to God, if you will. The second was actually used to take home and it was to be used for food, light in the house, so on and so forth. After that, it was different things. Medicine, um, different uh, light that you might use out and about, selling, so on and so forth. So there's a couple different steps for all those. But basically it boils down to this. What do you put first in your life? Number one should be God. Number two should be your family. And number three should be yourself. So, like I said, hopefully you're saved. If you're not, you make that decision. If you are, I hope you look at this picture of how they got the olive oil and then you get the order right. Put God first, your family second, and yourself last. So that's what I have.